to start this video and to get an understanding of the new Repub Republic structure that we're headed towards, we first have to understand the old Republic. Now, the old Republic is different than the current Republic that we're, current, that we're living under. And there's an anecdote that comes to mind to explain this contrast. In Logan, Ohio, there was a man of certain Indian or American Indian native or indigenous, whichever word you wish to use, either way from a old uh, ancestry to link to the old uh, republics, as it were, that existed here at the time of the founding of the Constitutional Republic. Now, he set up a gambling casino, which got shut down by the local so-called authorities, and then he took them to court in the current court system that we have, citing a treaty from 1790. Of course, they laughed him out of the courtroom, and he never got any redress for that. Most people today do not understand that we are not living under the Constitutional Republic. Therefore, the party to signing a treaty in 1790 would not be the same entity that we are currently ruled by today which is in fact the U.S. Code government, which is a corporation and in some sense a corporate republic. Although the republic portion of that would not be geared towards the human population of citizens, but rather towards the juridical public, i.e. corporations. Only corporations under our corporate republic have the ability to sway decisions, make votes, etc. We as the human population do not. So that is an example to explain the contrast between the old republic based off of human being input and the current republic we live the current republic that we live under, which is all based around juridical entities and not human. To start with, there are some things in the US Constitution that point to the mechanism of the original Old Republic. The main thing to focus on in this section of the Constitution under the duties and responsibilities of Congress is to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. Now notice that section is revised, so that's not really important. But to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. So here it puts under responsibilities of the U.S. Congress the jurisdiction, as it were, the spoken. Well, I guess in this case it would be more like a jurisdiction because a um, duty relative to piracy. Now we have to declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water. That is the responsibility of Congress, the U.S. Constitutional Congress, mind you, not the U.S. Code Congress, and certainly no Congresses of the phony states that we live under. Also, to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years, to provide and maintain a navy, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. Now that last part is perhaps the most important. Because the entire concept of a republic revolves around the enforcement mechanism. The ability to make others, whether they be individuals, companies, corporations, or um, contrary foreign governments, to do what you tell them to do and there be no choice in the matter, to simply make them do it. That is enforcement, forcing them to do something. So every structure will have a enforcement mechanism. And the old constitution revolved around the enforcement mechanism, mechanism of the militia. Now the militia, as far as the constitution con is concerned, is the only definition of the militia that we're concerned with in an understanding of the practical mechanism of the old republic. In this context, no other definitions of militia matter. 
and we find the definition of the militia under the Second Amendment, stating a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So the militia in the U.S. Constitution are those individuals who have the ability to keep and bear arms. Basic. Now, for the responsibilities of the Congress, it's the Congress's responsibility to ensure that the militia is armed and that there is a way to call them out. So, logically, there would have been militia armories that were open to all of the people that could keep and bear arms. Naturally, those who are incapacitated, disabled, etc., they would not be able to physically or perhaps in some cases mentally, keep and bear arms. So they wouldn't naturally be part of the militia. They wouldn't be called upon to enforce the law. All those who could would be, and thus they would be provided with arms, found at, essentially speaking, public armories, funded by tax dollars and whatever other sources of funds that Congress was able to uh, raise for that sort of thing. And then individuals would be able to go to those armories and they would receive training, among other things. Also, at those armories that were open to the public, of which essentially none exists now, every individual who is capable of keeping and bearing arms, being the people, would be essentially issued their own personal weaponry for whatever they decide to they need, as it were. The armory would be open to them. It would be about, it would be similar to how special operations in the military have their own dedicated armories, which they can go in and order anything that they know that they would need for any sort of personal need for any kind of operation they might be going on, right? They know best about what they'll need for that, so they go to the armory and they have a request all of the items that they would need likely nothing that's over the top or ridiculous because naturally you would have to justify whatever you are needing. You can't just go in and order a tank for no reason, as it were. However, anything that you would need to perform the job function of being a member of the militia, being one of the people who can keep and bear arms, they would have to provide you with that if they could. Some things they might not have been able to provide depending on what resources they had. However, in that context, you would essentially be armed free of charge because all of that stuff would be funded by actual public funds. Now, that's not the way that we're operating under today, but what we're trying to do is understand how the old republic mechanism actually functioned. Now, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the uniform of the militia issued to every single individual that was capable of keeping and bearing arms was gray. This is the reason why they state that the Confederates were gray, wore gray uniforms, whereas the Union wore blue. However, as some might notice, if you ever study the Civil War, you'll notice the lack of the militia. Now, considering in the Constitution how the militia is the primary law enforcement mechanism, you have to wonder what exactly happened there. That's a blank space, a question mark. Why wasn't the militia a major component in the Civil War, considering the fact that it was a major component in the Constitution? And also, why did the Army suddenly adopt the gray uniform, despite the fact that they always say that the Army wore blue? There's a lot of inconsistencies going on there. Not to mention nowadays, the army might wear gray, or did at least for that short period of time, wore gray uh, uniforms for um, their fatigues, but their, their dress uniform is not gray. Also, gray would be a relatively inexpensive color to make for uniforms, so it makes sense why it would be the color of the militia. Versus, of course, being green, which requires dyeing, or being blue, which also requires dyeing, or red. None of those colors are cheap to make, but gray certainly is a lot cheaper. And so, militia carrying gray uniforms would be logical. In addition, of course, Nathan Bedford Forrest, 
was likely a militia commander, which would justify the reason why he was reported to have gone off and went went about on his own of his own volition, basically, and pretty much gave no deference to the orders of Central Command in Richmond from the Confederate side. Because he wasn't actually Confederate, he was a militia commander going around in gray uniforms. And it's possible that many of the Confederate forces, if they were, either were mischaracterized or there were bodies of troops that were given gray uniforms out of the militia stores when in fact they were not really militia. But that's all conjecture, and either way, the history has been warped. But a lot of those questions are enough to poke holes in the strong narrative, and what we want to do is get an understanding, at least a general understanding, of how the old republic really functioned. Now, I did find in particularly one space only a singular mention of the Congress's responsibility to provide for the calling forth of the militia. However, in this context, it is the president calling out the militia, which constitutionally the president does not have that capability. It is the responsibility of Congress. Now, it would be possible that Congress might award that responsibility to the president, which is unlikely. And considering the context of this particular document, we know that wasn't true by the President of the United States a proclamation to the people of the United States of America. Whereas the laws of the United States have been for some time past, and at the time present and now, are opposed, and the execution thereof obstructed in the states of South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas, by combinations too powerful to be suppressed by the ordinary course of judicial proceedings, or by the powers vested in the marshals by law. There you go. Those are militia marshals. Therefore, I, Abraham Lincoln, or I as Abraham Lincoln, that's been struck out, President of the United States, in virtue of the power in me vested by the Constitution and the laws, I have thought fit to call out forth, and hereby do call out forth, the militia of the several states of the Union to the aggregate number of 75,000 in order to suppress said combinations and cause the laws to be duly executed. The details for this object will be made known immediately communicated to the state authorities through the War Department. I appeal to all loyal citizens to favor, facilitate, and aid this effort to maintain the honor and integrity and the existence of our national union and the perpetuity of popular government and to redress its injurious insults and injurious wrongs already too long endured. So what's happening here is first we have a mention of militia marshals. And that they are, in fact, the ones empowered by law to call it the militia, not the president. Now, the president, naturally speaking, would be the head of the armed forces in some context. But either way, this whole document reeks of a, 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 a fraud, basically. And the mention of state authorities would certainly not be the way that we think about it now, because the state authorities that we have have taken it upon themselves to enforce laws, which the Constitution does not allow. So they're not part of the old Constitutional Republic. That's important to note. Also, this would give credence to the idea that in the past, communities actually voted in the marshals that would call up the militia, which Congress would have the ability to delegate. And they would especially do if they feared that they would be removed and not have the ability to function anymore and thus ensure that the Constitutional Republic continued or persisted as long as possible. And that would give us an understanding about how the Lincoln War, the so-called Lincoln War, took place with Billy the Kid and the Regulators, in which the whole town rose up and the only way that it ever got ended was because the occupation forces sent the army, essentially, to suppress it. And this all happened around the Civil War period in which occupation forces, foreign to this country, basically, came in and affected their war against the people and all of the Indian republics that existed. Thus, they would not recognize such a thing as any treaties made in 1790. Now, some more evidence about this true nature of the old republic, which we've been lied to about by foreign occupiers, is in the Marine Corps uniform. The Marine Corps uniform is blue. 
However, it comes with red trim, noting, of course, the red blood stripe and the red lines that go around its border. And then, of course, we wear a white cover. Also, the rank insignia and service stripes are red and gold. That's very important because we do not, as Marines, wear dress green uniforms, except for the service uniforms, which were introduced during World War II. And we do not wear gray, nor do we wear the red of the British in the past. However, we do have red trim on our uniforms. So looking at the past color scheme of British uniforms during the colonial period, we will notice that the Navy wore blue and gold. Now our US Navy also wears blue and gold. And in the Marine Corps, our dress uniforms, our dress blues are blue, and they also have gold on them. However, the British, who most of us think as having an army, wore the red coat, right? The proverbial red coats, of which their colors were white, black, red, and gold, or just white, black, and red. However, <clears throat> that red color would actually be for the Marines, because likely at the time, they did not distinguish land from naval forces in the way that we do. And the Marines were actually, technically speaking, the land forces delivered for the Navy. So they were, in fact, a corporate incorporated part of the Navy, but their specific purpose was not to pilot ships or do anything like that, but to fight, to board, and to take over other vessels or do operations, invasion forces on land. Now, considering the th original 13 colonies, if there were even 13, of course, because there's a lot to say that there wasn't, well the Admiralty Court would send in Marines to occupy naval republics. And that's where we get the red incorporated into the dress blues of the Marine Corps, whereas the Navy, mostly anyway, doesn't wear red. Now, the uh, Enlisted Corps does have red on their um, rank insignias, but who knows when that was actually adopted. But either way, there's a clear distinction with the uniforms. Also, in addition, in semaphore, the red flag meant no quarters, which meant that when they engaged in battle, they were going to decimate the opposing side or obviously die trying. That's what red meant. Black, on the other hand, meant they would take prisoners as far as those go. So a red uniform at sea would, in fact, impose fear on an enemy when they saw that red uniformed or red coats were boarding because it meant they were all going to get killed. And a lot of people might jump overboard or try to save themselves, etc. So it was an intimidation factor. Now, the Marines in the United States would not wear red coats because of the implications, the, um, the history, as it were, of that use. Whereas the British continued to wear red coats well into the 20th century. On the other hand, the red was still incorporated into the Marine Corps uniform because it was the color of the Marines, not the Army. Now, as I said before, the Admiralty Court, which still exists today, was a very egregious entity for the original uh, colonies of the United States, of which they were mostly seafaring entities. They did not expand out, expand out into the greater part of the North American continent until, of course, uh, the occupation forces came in and kicked out all of the Indian republics, because at the time they coexisted with the Indian republics mostly on peaceful terms. So when the Admiralty Court ordered occupation of Boston, it was not the army that they sent in because the Admiralty Court would not have the ability to call in the army. It would have been the Marines, the Royal Marines, at least, of the British Empire. 
So that creates a completely different context to our understanding of how the old republic worked, which of course the occupying forces that are still in power today would not want us to know. So, so one thing to understand is that during the period of the War for Independence, a majority of the population were veterans. They had fought in many wars, including the French and Indian War. They were capable individuals who had an understanding of arms and tactics. And they were the ones that set up the militia mechanism of the old republic, which was essentially derailed after the so-called Civil War, in which the occupying forces set up Washington, D.C., and made their war on the people. However, that idea, as far as I can tell, persisted uh, later and was not probably fully eradicated until the Prohibition era, era and the uh, phony FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, although who knows if they really investigate anything. Who really knows what that word means, considering it means it has vest in it, like to vest something with or like that other document said, to be vested by the laws. Either way, this whole idea, the concept, was about reducing down the control of the republic to the individual level, rather than having a hierarchical structure ruling over everyone. But on the other hand, there was a way that things were done orderly, and where those with the merit for something were selected over those that didn't. Whereas the occupational forces, they require that we are weakened, and thus they select those without merit over those that have merit. That can tangibly occupy the positions that they're selected for, because the whole idea of the occupying forces that we have today is to essentially keep the old republic from coming back. And in some ways, it likely never will come back, because we have moved on from that type of world. Now the next component that is little understood, which was mentioned in the Constitution, but is no longer carried out by a Constitutional Congress, are the Letters of Mark. Now the basic idea behind the Letters of Mark is that the Congress or the King, depending on which time period you're talking about, and which ruling structure is at work, they would award a letter of authentication, essentially, to whomever they might contract with. Of course, it's not really a contract, not in the sense that we would think of a contract. The letters of Mark are granted documents, which most likely would be sealed with a wax seal and stamped with an insignia, basically listing out that this person has the permission to do such and such, and that they will go out and raid or pirate property from someone else and then bring it back and they will keep a portion of it and that's their payment payment and plunder those are letters of mark letters of mark would apply apply to privateering or what other what the enemy would call piracy on the sea and raiding on the land now elements of this old idea this old concept of Letters of Mark are incorporated into the Marine Corps under the Marine Corps Raiders. Now, what's interesting about this is that raiding usually takes place on land, and by and large, the Marines usually operate on land unless they're doing boarding or something like that. But the Marine Raiders, their job would logically to be go around and take things from the enemy. Of course, they don't do it under Letters of Mark. They do it as an incorporated component of the armed forces. So that is one carryover from that old concept into the modern world. Next we have the most common example of a raid, which isn't piracy because it's not conducted on the high seas. When it is conducted on the high seas it's considered piracy, but when it's on land it's in a raid. And this modern form of the raid comes from the phony law enforcement or what many would call a police raid, even if it's involving sheriffs, ATF, state troopers, DEA or some other organization with initials acting out the purpose listed in the Constitution for the militia, which is interesting. The modern form of the letters of Mark listed out in the Constitution is the search warrant. Despite the fact that it's called a warrant and it's done under judicial disguise, it is in fact 
the idea of the letters of Mark from the U.S. Constitution, in which in this case, a representative of the corporate government, a so-called judge, will sign a paper giving permission to a certain unit to go and raid an area. That is the concept behind the letters of Mark. Now, some explanation about how the privateers actually operated, at least prior to the Constitutional Republic, because that might have changed when legitimacy was given by the Constitution to privateering. And this was this example is from the Levantine Adventurer, The Travels and Missions of the Chevalier d'Arvue, 1653 to 1697, by Warren H. Lewis. Here it states, an English pirate with the improbable name of Plumen, operating out of the Tuscan port of Leghorn, had between 1694 and 1697 captured several French ships and ultimately had become such a nuisance that Louis XIV, on the petition of the Marseilles ship owners, ordered his envoy at Florence to obtain satisfaction. Satisfaction which the Grand Duke of Tuscany, Cosimo de' Medici, would gladly have given for several reasons. Firstly, because he had the misfortune to marry a first cousin of Louis XIV, and secondly, as an ally of France, but chiefly because Plumen, though an Englishman by birth, had become a naturalized Tuscan and was acting in impudent defiance of the Grand Duke's authority, for he had been given leave to fit out his corsair in the Tuscan port only on the strict understanding that he did not molest French shipping. Dupre, French envoy to Tuscany, had done his best with the business, but when it became obvious that he was out of his depth, Darvu, of whose skill all were persuaded, was asked to go out to Florence and clear the matter up. He accepted the assignment, and his instructions were given him on June 13, 1697. Darvu was only a day or two in Leghorn before he found out the reason for the apparent impotence of the Grand Duke, which was that Plumen was as skilled in legal chicane as he was in piracy. He had entered two pleas in bar of judgment. The particular point at issue was the seizure of two French merchantmen in 1696, whilst England and France were at war. Plumen claimed that he was then an Englishman acting as an English privateer, to which the Grand Duke of lawyers retorted that, on the contrary, he was a Tuscan acting as an Italian pirate. Whereupon Plumen fell back on a second line of defense, namely that whilst he admitted his presence on board the ship in question, the King Charles, at the material time, he maintained that the ship belonged not to him but to a certain Pickering, who was acting under letters of mark issued by the Prince of Orange. Though it was notorious in shipping circles that Pickering was a man of straw, and that from whatever source the venture was financed, it was most certainly not with Pickering's money. In many cases, this old method of privateering or piracy or raiding on land, as it were, we can find elements of it today with shell corporations and operating under assumed names. That's exactly what that situation was talking about. A ring of backers using uh, various uh, instruments of cover and, of course, acting under an assumed name. All of those things we find today in regard to corporations, and especially in regard to the phony law enforcement with such things as undercovers, literally called undercovers, and, of course, uh, overseas banking. All these other mechanisms are alive today, but mainly in the hands of a certain few, and not in the hands of the many, whereas in that time period before the Constitutional Republic, it would have been the same thing. Such capabilities were only present to those in higher levels, whereas the Constitutional Republic afforded the ability to legitimize these letters of mark to a Constitutional Republic that was controlled by the people with the law enforcement mechanism being reduced to the militia, not the police, sheriffs, state troopers, or any of those other ones. So anytime someone goes around and says they're a constitutional sheriff, there is no such thing as far as our U.S. Constitution goes. They are a U.S. Code sheriff. That is a very important distinction. But here we get a good understanding of what exactly the idea behind letters of mark and rating really is and the reason why it is done under different names today such as the search. Now we're going to go ahead and take a look at the current republic, 
which in the case of the United States is called probably the U.S. Code government is applicable, or the U.S. Code Republic. But in other senses, such as with the Vatican City, it would be the Canonic Code Republic, and other places you might call it something different. Either way, it is the same idea, it is structured the same way, and it is occupational in reference to the legitimate old republics that used to rule in, in place of code republics, corporate republics, right? Corporate occupation. Now, the first component in this modern republic system is the support component. When it comes to any sort of operation, the support mechanisms have to be there first, because if you go out there without support, then you're doomed to fail. Now, the first support mechanism will be research and analysis. And this component is still alive in the Constitution idea, where you first have to figure out what you have available or where you can get things that will expand your resources and everything else. The research and analysis is your first component because you need knowledge in order to be effective. Now, the next component will be logistics. And this can come in many forms. It could be forming stockpiles, creating mechanisms in which you can get those stockpiles out. And in fact, the idea of providing for the calling forth of the militia is part of logistics. So logistics comes after you know what you're doing, what you're going to do. Well, yeah, when you know what you're doing, you know what you're going to do, but also where you're going to do it. You know, the usual questions of who, what, when, where, why, and how. Logistics is the component of how. So you're going to do it. You need supplies, resources, you need stuff, and everybody needs to know where to go to get that stuff, basically. Now, the next component will be communications. Once you have the knowledge and understanding of what you're going to do, where you're going to do it, how you're going to do it, etc., once you have the stuff that's required to do that, well, you need a communication mechanism to coordinate between all of your components. Now, communication could be understood as being part of logistics. However, today it is an entirely separate component altogether. It is not just a component of logistics because communications also will have to do with, it, with things like electronic warfare, being able to deny the enemy communications themselves, and thus in, it, in its essence, communications has become a entirely separate component from logistics, a very important component in the modern mechanism of the current code republics. Now, the next component that used to be incorporated into an, another one, such as research and analysis, but now as a standalone uh, section all on its own, is innovation. The ability to outperform through creating things that are beyond the capabilities of an opponent has become a staple among the modern mechanism that we live under today. And strangely, in most contexts, the code entities that rule the world today are fighting bitterly against this particular aspect, which is innovation. Now, next in these this uh, two-tier divided system are the operations. So all of those entities that we looked at before, or concepts, they all apply to this ultimate objective, which is that of operations. Those that will actually go out and carry out the mission and do all of this thing, this stuff that the support mechanism is built to support. Now, the first mechanism when it comes to operations is scouting. Scouting requires to have requires the having of entities in different areas that will actually go out operationally they'll collect data they will also coordinate and they will know beforehand with boots on the ground as the proverbial word goes but it doesn't necessarily have to be boots on the ground because it could be you know drones or any other sort of thing but either way scouting is an important and integral component of operations it is it could be considered the first operation when you're carrying out a mission. Now comes the idea of enforcement or the tangible operation to get done what you want done. 
And today, most of that stuff is carried out through signage. The majority of people respond to enforcement through posted signs, which seems ridiculous, but is the context of what we live in, of what system, system we live under. We live under a system of enforcement through signs, because by and large, people obey traffic signs. They also obey permitted signs, no trespassing signs. The enforcement of laws actually comes down most of the time to what sign is posted. Now, the final component to operations, the one that most people focus on, but usually things happen before we get to that stage, and that is the use of arms, physical force. When not all else fails, the use of weaponry to make somebody either do what you say or die is the ultimate component to enforcement. And the reason why the Constitution revolves it around the militia is so that ultimately the people will not have something imposed on them like the Admiralty Court did prior to the War for Independence. Of course, we have everything that but the militia today, where we have all of these phony court systems acting exactly like the Admiralty Court did in the War for Independence and issuing letters of mark, or what they call search warrants, to leverage physical force against the people. They are occupational forces, just like the occupational forces before the War for Independence. Now, with this transition to the New Republic, the current U.S. Code, as far as the United States goes, but really around the world, the current Code Republics, the Code Governments, all acting on behalf of the Canonic Code of the Universal Church, well, they, above all else, do not want to lose control. Because when they lose control, they will lose control everywhere and over everything. So rather than lose control, they would rather burn everything down, literally. And this is an idea behind all of the empty housing projects that are popping up everywhere, which are essentially tinderboxes. Once one goes up, it catches fire on all the other ones. All the other ones catch fire. And they move down like dominoes, creating an inferno that is very difficult to stop. And this is easily done through use of the metered connections that are installed. And then at some time, they essentially trigger a firebomb, creating enough of a inferno to literally burn everything. So that is something that's going to need to be dealt with before we actually transition to the new republic, because they do not want that to happen. Now, the concept of the new republic is a if statement, pretty much. It's a theory. Because we won't know what the new republic will actually look like until it is the current republic, the one in force, right? Once the current republic is the old republic, then we'll know what the new republic really is. So at this point, we can only make conjecture. But we do have an idea of some components of what it will look like, and especially those components that the current code republic desires to stop. So when I was a kid, I used to play a game called Command and Conquer Red Alert. And I did this by loading a CD or a DOS CD-ROM into a computer port. And then once that game was downloaded, I would essentially be playing against the computer or what we now refer to as AI. But either way, it was a written computer program with a particular purpose to engage an individual in a simulation of a uh, fake war, basically. But all of this stuff was done through the CD-ROM mechanism. Now, in the first Matrix movie, because the next two are complete garbage, the main character, Neo, wakes up to messages on his computer. His computer is clearly not in his control, and somebody's communicating to him. But he thinks it's a uh, mirage from, say, staying awake too late or something like that. But also, when his, uh, there's a knock at his door, he provides a CD, right? A disc, and warns not that the other person should not be caught with it. And of course, he follows the white rabbit, which leads him down the rabbit hole to being what is now called today being red-pilled. 
although at the time he was just offered a red pill or a blue pill. Either way, he was, when he was chosen, he was manipulating the programs, the computer programs on CDs. Now in the Matrix, what the what Morpheus described in a blank room, which was a written computer program, was a world in which human beings were turned into batteries. But not only that, they were living in a computer program where all of the rules could be rewritten, just like somebody can rewrite the computer program that is contained on a video game CD. And in that context, you essentially, the only limitations that you have are based off of what you do in that computer game. Also in the Matrix, they were able to print countless amounts of throwaway weapons, as it were, and ammunition. That's the same idea as going into a computer program on a video game and changing the amount of ammunition that you have to unlimited for your side. Of course, eventually when you really get into the code of many of these old computer games and people often did this they would get bored and they would actually completely rewrite the program and take it over just the way neo went and completely rewrote the agent program taking that over so of course the subsequent videos completely assumed the or subsumed the uh, idea that was being put forward in the first movie and completely changed it and made it something that made no sense. Completely illogical. But either way, the first video gives this con conceptualized understanding of rewriting a program based off of the CD-ROM video game concept that was alive during the early 2000s. Now imagine a world in which the programming of people's behavioral habits is rewritten in context to the government. In this way, every single individual across an interconnected network would be able to summon to their own personal use in some cases, possibly the militia. But it would be in a modern context of rapid interconnectivity. So if somebody is committing an individual crime, say breaking into somebody's house, committing a murder, etc., well, that individual would be able to blast the uh, evidence of the event to the community that they're in and would have all of the community members the ability and capability to instantly respond to that as it's happening. That is a level of the ability to call out the militia were being reduced down to not only the individual, but in a much faster way than was ever envisioned by those that wrote the original Constitution, and also takes it out of the hands of the Congress to do that, and actually gives it out to every individual person. Now, yes, there are problems that somebody could bring up with that, but the problems are moot, because the problems that would come from something, they don't... They, they, the thing of it itself progressing is not concerned with those problems. Only those that want to stop something like that happening will bring up problems usually to try to poke holes in it to say, oh, you know, this shouldn't happen. But it will happen one way or the other because that is the way that we're going. The idea of a community response, an instant response anyway, community-wise to particular incidents that are happening taking it also out of the hands of the corrupt code enforcement, the phony law enforcement that we have today, the corrupt code republic, well, they definitely, above all else, want to stop that from happening. Now, in this concept, where you would have an individual who can basically call up the militia, you wouldn't necessarily need to vote in militia commanders, but it would probably be a good idea. Either way, though, those in the community who are capable of responding to such a crisis would have the volition to do so. And that is the concept behind the old republic, but it's done in a much more, much quicker and more modern way through the power of decentralized communication or what most people think of as the Internet. Now, at this point, the Internet is controlled through university-based servers, as far as I'm aware. And those individuals 
are doing everything that they possibly can to keep this type of world from happening because this type of world is a nightmare to them because they completely lose control. Once the enforcement mechanism is gone, once their threats become useless, then they have no power at all. It's completely gone and the power is back in the hands of the people as it was during the Constitutional Republic which was the reason for the Civil War, except in this context, it would be much more difficult to implement the Civil War that they did in the 1860s in, old, in order to subvert that constitutional republic. And so what we'd actually be living under is a different form of constitutional republic, one that is written through computer programs and is decentralized to every community and is essentially a conglomerative effort of all human beings across the planet. Now, logically, many of those more difficult to handle situations, which call for a much more organized approach, those would likely actually be contracted out to a large number of independent corporations or companies of people who are professionals in dealing with certain issues, where the community itself is not necessarily capable of handling something the community could get together through, say, crowdfunding I type of sources anyway we can look at it through a crowdfunding lens and then they would contract out with whatever entity they thought would be the best choice now in our current environment with the controlled system that won't happen because of the censorship on crowdfunding sources but in this type of new republic you will have a large number of contractor companies whose entire purpose it is to respond to crisis and they will all be competing for contracts with local communities and or larger communities and it will be a merit based system who's the best at their job not who's the best on paper now the reason why communities would contract out to certain companies that are professional and organized to do things like this of which there will be many is because you'll have right-minded people who get together and develop resources and plans for addressing difficult and complicated situations. Now, there might not be that many that have to respond to different, there might not be that many situations that are difficult and complicated. But either way, a lot of the situations that are not handled very well today are simple ones. Responding to a fire is relatively simple. Responding to earthquakes, storms, or um, crimes, right? All of those things are relatively simple. They can be handled by most communities without them having to pay anyone. So a lot of the crises that would be complicated and would require contractors might have to do with, with elaborate uh, organizations that form themselves to conduct operations of fraud or scams or raids or things like that. So these would be contracted entities who are there to respond to essentially other entities and keep some sort of control system that's natural and organic reduced down to the um, individual level and it will make the entire global system operate in a interconnected fashion that is similar to the time before, in fact, the new, the old Republic, when you had privateers and pirates all over. Now, one of the main components that will be a issue, and is, in fact has already been solved but has not been implemented yet, is the idea of authentication. Banks already know how authentication measures work. As soon as you have a charge on your bank account that is abnormal, they lock your account until you say whether or not you did it. And if you did do it, then they unlock your account. And if you didn't do it, then they fix the problem. That is the same idea as authenticating something based off of its user history. If you have a message sent by uh, an address which has no usage history or some identifier, other identifier, well, then that will instantly be eliminated by pre-written computer programs, and each person will not have to click whether or not it's a scam call or not because it will automatically filter that stuff out. Now, 
you could go through and check that stuff. But either way, internet history will be a major indicator for authentication. But as most know, authentication is best when there's multiple layers to the authentication. Either way, with a more advanced and more reduced system to the individual level of enforcement, authentication will be another component of that. And thus, we will have authentication measures that today we can't even conceptualize because of the manipulation by the code republics.